Welcome. This is Rhetoric of Computer Games. First of all, I'd like to say, what is a game? Now you can see there are five possibilities here. And if you look at all of them, you can see the correct answer is E, all of the above. Now there's many different kind of games. They're called game genres. There's computer games, there's board games, there's role-playing games, first-person shooters. There's uh, many different kinds of games that children play and adults play. But a more difficult question is what is rhetoric? Now rhetoric Again, there are five possibilities here. And most likely, the best answer is E for my students. Because rhetoric is an unusual word. I'll explain that later. There are values, any society or any kind of culture will have values, but uh, there, here we're talking about values for inside the game and outside the game. And there's a community of people that uh, when they come together to play a game, they create a new community. And this new community is separate from work or from other things. It becomes a new community. Now, play is another one of those words that sounds like easy, uh, but here is play is the free space of movement within a more rigid structure. Structure is some kind of design uh, and uh, creation. Now, there, according to Sutton Smith, there are seven different rhetorics of play. Progress. Now, progress is kind of like a plot. If this were a book, it would be like a plot. Fate is something that uh, cannot be avoided. And of course, there's always an element of power. There are players in the game that have more power and others that have less power. Then, of course, there's identity. Each one role of each different player is a different identity. identity. And, of course, people must use their imagination because it's not real. And, of course, there is a sense of self because the identity means that you are different from other people. And, finally, frivolous is the last rhetoric of play. Frivolous means not essential, not important, not necessary. Now, there's... A game really is a kind of possibility space. There's a set of rules, but it's more than rules, it's more than design. Um, it's a kind of whatever is possible within the game to do. For example, here we've got poetry. Now poetry has a set of rules that you can do. Uh, for example, haiku. A palindrome is another uh, set of rules. Palindrome is a word that begins with, well, I'll explain more of that later. And then there's lipogram, uh, which is a text without a certain word, a letter. And also there is some interesting things about children making rules for games. Now let's talk about the first one in this list, poetry. Okay, we've got poetry, haiku, five, seven, five syllables. Okay, and again, these rules created are exploited to make very interesting kind of language. Uh, and it's more like a game because it has what are called constraints constraints. 
Now palindromes, for example, are words that have the same letters forwards and backwards. For, for example, the letter I, or the word I, E-Y-E, -E, uh, and the word race car begins with an R and ends with an R and uh, is exactly you can even have sentences like do geese see God and murder for a jar of red rum again you can if you reverse the order it still remains the same so it's a very interesting one to look at palindromes which is a kind of constraint on language now lipograms are a little bit different. A lipogram is when you remove a certain letter. For example, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Now, fleece, for example, if we remove the letter E, then we must change this word into something else. And now you have the word white here, for example, has an E in it, so you have to change the word. So this becomes, Mary had a tiny lamb. It's fleece, not fleece, but wool, was pallid, not uh, white, but pallid. And if you notice, that there are not any E's in the whole poem right through here. Now, rule changes. The rules can change in games. And uh, which do you think is the age group where most of the games well, actually, it turns out that A is the correct answer. Children are learning to play new games, and so they learning how to play creates an ability or an, a necessity to try out new rules. So they try the game, play the game, and then change the rules and play it again to see what kind of game works better. So they're testing games and learning like that. Now, computer games allow you to explore a what's called possibility space, okay, when you're uh, learning the uh, game by itself. Now, there is an author, his name is Ian Bogost, and he writes about uh, video games and computer games, and he says that in a very, very important work that procedurality, procedure. Procedure is when you go from step by step by step uh, from one thing to another. And these procedures or processes, uh, they create that possibility of what you can and cannot do in the game. And that what is what creates play. Now, if we look at rhetoric, the word rhetoric here means uh, well-made words. In ancient Greece, uh, they were very concerned with public speaking. There was very little writing uh, until the end uh, and later in Greek civilization. But uh, there wasn't uh, much history for a long time. Uh, one of the famous philosophers, Socrates, thought that writing things down would cause people not to learn so much. But also, it means persuasion. Can you persuade people to uh, change their mind? So again, there's whole, these ideas about thinking. So we can see that rhetoric can also be an identification of people. Uh, it can be non-oral. Uh, rhetoric normally is considered something about speaking, but it can be also non-oral. It can be non-verbal. It can be graphic and it can have a visual rhetoric like a recent um, from about 200 years ago uh, a philosopher named Burke. Now uh, we can have a digital rhetoric there's certain kinds of ways rules about making email you must put in a subject the subject should be uh, descriptive and there is certain rhetoric for web pages. You must uh, have HTML at the beginning and the end, and blogs and PowerPoint. All of these different software have rules about how to use them effectively. But with games, we get a procedural rhetoric, which is a kind of a rhetoric, and it uh, is a kind of uh, the author 
the person that writes or makes the software makes different kinds of procedures and these procedures determine the rules and so therefore it they are part of the design of the game and so it makes a description of a what's called dynamic models which is another word for game So the arguments for uh, with are become processes, or are made up of processes, and they extend to these kind of things can also extend beyond computer games. Okay. So these are hidden ways of thinking, and you can uh, expose or explain things. Uh, you can uh, show about social and political or cultural behavior okay it's kind of like a picture that shows uh, a new view but not using uh, visuals but it uses procedures to show okay so some example for example the McDonald's game is uh, a very good one it is uh, a game where you have to set up and you have to run a restaurant and you have to get uh, go farming to make the uh, to get the food to make the food and then serve it to people and then uh, to be successful though in this game you have to destroy the environment and you have to exploit your workers and you have to do some really really terrible things to be successful so this procedure actually shows you how uh, running a restaurant like McDonald's is really bad for society. And that procedure that shows you how you have to do uh, all of the things to make the restaurant successful uh, is, is bad for society. That procedure is what the rhetoric is all about. So, you should try to get uh, literacy of procedures. You should try to understand about procedures. You can learn programming or about how people make procedures and you should be creative uh, to help you out to understand all of this about games and that games are very very important as far as learning but also as uh, cultural artifacts. Games are art in a way. Thank you very much.